This is the EWN Podcast Network. Welcome to Late Boomers, our podcast guide to creating your third act with style, power, and impact. Hi, I'm Kathy Worthington. And I'm Mary Elkins. Join us as we bring you conversations with successful entrepreneurs, entertainers, and people with vision who are making a difference in the world. Everyone has a story, and we'll take you along for the ride on each interview, recounting the journey our guests have taken to get where they are, inspiring you to create your own path to success. Let's get started. I'm Kathy Worthington. Today, our special guest on Late Boomers is Dahlia Dupree, author of three contemporary romance novels. She's also a licensed psychotherapist and worked as a psychiatric social worker and as a school administrator before focusing on her writing career. And I'm Mary Elkins. Dahlia has won two Emma, that's E-M-M-A, awards that are given for diversity in publishing and is a Spectrum Grant recipient. Her books, Orange Blossoms, Love Blooms, Anything But Love, and Soft Lies and Hard Truths are emotion-driven novels with complex plots and multi multicultural characters. We're looking forward to hearing more about them and about Dahlia. Welcome, Dahlia. Thank you. Happy to Good be Good to have you here. Dahlia, please tell us about your background and how it shaped your novels and how you came to the career path you find yourself on today. Okay, well, I have to say that I have always wanted to be a writer. And I first had uh, poetry and short stories published when I was in elementary school up in the San Francisco Oakland Bay area. I had a teacher, Mrs. Jones, and she would have us submit our work to the local newspaper. And so I loved writing even then. And I had decided, and if I think back on it in middle school, well, in high school, I had a column in our school paper, which was, oh. you know, I would ask questions, ask, you know, different student questions. So I had a column and then I attended UCLA as an undergrad and I was a managing editor of the black student newspaper called Nomo. And so, and my undergraduate degree is in English, in English literature. Um, and so I initially thought I'm going to either go into writing or counseling. And I realized that I really have a love for stories. And the house that I grew up in had a built-in sort of live, not, not a built-in library. I shouldn't say that. That sounds more grand than it was, but, you know, built-in <laughs> bookshelves in the living room. And it came complete with a lot of uh, textbooks, a lot of classic books, not really textbooks, but Shakespeare, Edgar Allan Poe, a lot of English authors. So I just, and I also grew up in a household where books were everywhere, I, I should say. Oh. Every, there were, my mother was an avid reader. My father read Westerns. We really had totally, I'm one of seven children. We really had uncensored reading apps. And um, I think at that time, we really didn't have a, I, I don't recall there being a market that was just for children. So it's also that we read whatever adult books there were. I was reading really early Daniel Steele. I was reading uh, Sidney Sheldon's novels, The Other Side of Midnight. I mean, just whatever I could get my hands mm-hmm. on. And so I loved, um, I loved reading. I loved writing. And the first job after I got out of undergrad school was with a publishing company um, in L.A., in Beverly Hills. So I worked there for about three years. Had nothing to do, my job had nothing to do with publishing, but I was at the company. <laughs> uh, so at some point... You were a psychotherapist um, then? I wasn't. I was working at the publishing company. I had not gone on to graduate school. I just had my undergrad degree in English literature. And I started, it was, it took me a while to get back to creative writing. And so I did not, what actually what happened is while I was working at this publishing company, I ended up um, doing volunteer work for an organization called the Los Angeles Commission 
on assaults against women. And we actually worked with battered women and rape survivors. I volunteered initially. The LA Times used to have a Sunday column that had volunteer opportunities. And I had already grad, I already had my undergraduate degree and I felt like, oh, I, you know, I have some free time. A lot of my friends had moved back to their homes. I stayed in Los Angeles. And when I started doing that work on the side for my regular job, I found out, I discovered that I really found it so rewarding and I found it so fulfilling. It was emotionally challenging work. I remember my mother was really concerned when I first told her about it. She said, how are you going to be able to handle that? And I remember I was sharing some of the stories that I had heard with her and I was getting fearful. She said, I don't know if you should really do this. You're already saying you're not going to get married. And now this is going to make you not want to get married even more. I, I did change my mind later. Oh. But so I started doing this uh, volunteer work and eventually I ended up doing that. Uh, as a, I, I came with a company, I joined the company, I should say, and I ended up doing it as a job. The women that I worked with there were telling me, you know, if you want to stay on the field, it's like back school. You need to get another, you need to get a degree in it. And then you have to, I didn't realize it would be a long path to get licensed. Um, but so I did end up going back to school. And, but I, I just found that, and I can even really say right now that I think that that work at the LA Commission on Assault Against Women, which is now called Peace Over Violence, um, which is sort of headed over, which isn't really the proper way to put it, but by a woman named Patty Giddens, she's a dynamo. And she probably has helped so many young women develop and grow and reach their potential. And uh, so, but that, starting out as a volunteer and then going on to be a part of that organization for seven years, it's really what motivated me and prompted me to go ahead and get my uh, license as a psychotherapist. Um, and so what I found is the interweaving kind of uh, the story that is the written word and the mm -hmm. story that is the spoken word and I found that I'm actually in love with stories. And so, mm -hmm. and that's what's meaningful to me, right? Whether I am reading stories, uh, you know, reading a book, a novel, I'm listening when I'm exercising and walking, I'm listening, if I'm not listening to a podcast about writing, I'm probably listening to a novel. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I mm -hmm. movies, I Twitter, and, what I felt when I first started as a volunteer at this organization, the organization that I was at, which is where we would be on the hotline at some point, meeting rape survivors at the hospital so they wouldn't have to be alone when evidence kits were taken, speaking, doing conferences and workshops, you know, pertaining to violence against women. But what I found is that I was really honored to have women share their stories with me. It did not. Mm -hmm. It was not a burden. It was never a well, burden. It let's talk fun. about that, because I'd like to know some of the common themes that run through your books. And this sounds like one of them. Can you elaborate? Yeah. Well, I think that on the sort of exterior, I think that it, if you look at the covers, it looks like, oh, these are romance novels. And they are. Yes, I have novels. one right here by you. That's my, <laughs> yes, yeah, that's one of, that's the, the first full-length novel that I did have published. And uh, I think that because of my background and because of my training, and I'm still a therapist, I, I still do therapy part-time, um, and I'm more mm -hmm. limited capacity, but I'm still doing that. Uh, I find that my stories tend to have a certain level of depth and complexity. And it's not that I am setting out intentionally saying, oh, I'm going to make sure this is really deep. I'm not doing that at all. But I think that we know that, er, that each individual has so many different dimensions and aspects of themselves that create the person that we see, at least externally. And yeah. so when mm -hmm. I'm writing, they are definitely 
there is romance involved, but there's also family members. The backgrounds tend to emerge. So it's kind of when we learn about someone's family, when I learn about someone's family, then it's putting together the pieces of the puzzle. And it's not to assume that we know, right? Because I think the other part that I think is that we all make up stories. And so we look at different people and sorry, I'm going to squeeze it. Excuse me. Bless but, you. Um, oh, bless you. <laughs> So we all look at different people and we think we know something about them based on their appearance, right? Um, and whether they're tall or short or they have long fingernails or if they're, you know, however they're dressed and uh, our outward view of them. And so the characters in the novel, it's the same way. They initially have views of the other characters as they're introduced. And so if you even look at Orange Blossoms, Love Loom, which is book one of a three-part series. And I'm working on the, the final edit for the third mm. book right now. It's already been written, sent off to the publisher. There's a going back and forth process, of course, to edit. Um, but mm -hmm. in any case, so there's a, the main character, Elaine, who initially seems to be one way. And she has a view of a man that she meets. And she makes a lot of assumptions about him. She assumes that he comes from wealth because he does come from a, a wealthy family, although she's definitely middle class herself because her family owns Orange Grove and have been in her family for many years. But he has some power over her because her family has the loan over her future, she feels actually, not her personally, but, uh, but because his bank owns the um, loan that the family owns towards the property. But his story is a more complex one, uh, the feeling of living up to his family's expectations of having failed earlier when he was younger, of having a marriage that did not work. And it looks one way in the beginning, but truthfully, each character has to come to their own defining point when they take some agency of their own life and not feel like they're victims of it, right? Which is a journey that we all go on to some degree. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. but there's a series of obstacles in each of the novels. There, and so there, the novels are peopled by complex characters. There's an uncle who's a very bitter person in the novel. He's a very angry person. And I have to say, initially, when I first started uh, my fiction writing more seriously, I, uh, the feedback I got on the very first version of Orange Blossom's Love Bloom from some people in publishing, editors and uh, who else, editors and other already uh, published authors was like, well, you know, there's really no bad characters in here. And have you ever met a man that was all good? And I was like, oh, you know, I can't I have. And initially, it was difficult to write these more uh, characters who were not necessarily the villain, but kind of the characteristics of the villain. And, and but I had mm -hmm. to really pull on some of my experiences because initially, I I was making it to um, everyone was really just kind of too perfect, and you know, people really don't want to read about perceived perfect people. Right. That's not very interesting. We want to know yeah. that they've had and that they've had obstacles so that they overcame them, um, that they had their journey to a better tomorrow. They fought for mm -hmm. it. Uh, but I started thinking about some of the experiences I had working with different families. I also worked for the Department of Children and Family Services before working with children who had been removed from their homes mm -hmm. because of abuse and neglect. I started thinking about some of the parents who had told me they actually did not want their children. I thought like, we could keep them in the system. Anyway, I started thinking about some of my knowledge, not just the, the world that I like to fantasize about, but I started, but to, to actually add those characters that kind of put down the obstacle. So even though the uncle is a character in Orange Blossom's Love Blue, who seems like a very disgruntled um, kind of, you know, a grumpy older man who's rude and, and uh, really is not thoughtful or considerate in how he uses his words. And he's very um, kind of short-tempered with his niece, uh, 
So the one in particular, there are two of them. There's Elaine and there's Morgan, who's in the next novel, um, the focus mm -hmm. of the next novel. But we learn a little bit about his background and we understand that. It doesn't make him a likable character particularly, but we understand. <laughs> yeah, sort of. <laughs> but, yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't make him likable because he's, you know, he's up to different things and he's more difficult. Like what I found with that first novel where I did have, not Orange Blossoms, Love Blooms, but the first novel that I don't think will ever get published, but it was it was a historical romance with the same story, but a different context. And um, I did have one character in that who was a very, very bad character. When I had some um, people review that, data readers, all they could talk about was that bad character. They could not believe how horrible he was. And I thought, aha. So that's the way it goes to. That's who's more memorable. It's the, the character that mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what's really that's all what we that's all what we get from movies always. Yeah. I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about the representation of various ethnicities in your novels. Okay. So I certainly read why you know very widely myself. And I think that and for the longest time, actually I would just pick up books at the airport or at the drugstore and which are not very diverse. Nor, If you look, it'll be, mostly be white authors that are in those public places. It's better now than it used to be. But, uh, mm -hmm. and I realized, well, I'm not just many diverse books as I could be reading. So I'm just grabbing what's right there in my face that I see all the time because I'm thinking, hey, I want a book. Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, it was just as people who read a lot do, right? Yeah, I can always use another book and whatever it's easily available um mm -hmm. but and certainly i've read authors from all over the world for me for my book um you know that the term diverse books is such an interesting the, the term diverse is an interesting term in a way because what's diverse to me might not be diverse to you right so i know that mm -hmm. there's one walk one author i heard speaking at a book signing and she said i write inclusive books and so they just include different people. And I certainly, I live in Los Angeles. Um, and mm -hmm. Los Angeles is very different. And in my world, and in the world I have grown up in, I grew up on military bases part of the time, a lot, a lot of diversity. And, uh, but in my world, I see all different ethnicities. And some people may not in their world. They may not in their town. Mm -hmm. They may not feel comfortable writing about different groups because it's not their experience. In my experience, I could see, you know, I'm seeing an Asian person at the grocery store. I may see someone from India. I may see uh, a Latino somewhere else. And so my books are inclusive of that because the books take place in California. And so the California mm -hmm. that yeah. I know, not that we don't have our segregated communities, but the California that I know is not segregated. It is a, it has people not only of different social economic classes, but it has different ethnic and cultural groups. And so those characters, the doctor, when, not to give away any uh, spoilers or anything, but um, Elaine's doctor, a uh, doctor, Elaine's father is being in the hospital. And so the doctor is uh, a woman of Indian descent from India. In, in the mm -hmm. um, or her father's best friend uh, is Men Manuel Montoya. And he is a Mexican American man. Yeah. Uh, and so when the ambulance drivers come to get him, one is Latino and one is Asian. And so I just don't, uh, I don't just have the assumption that everybody is one ethnic group because I haven't had that experience. And so my That's character- That's great because it just could flow and it can be natural to the plot and natural to the setting, California or Los Angeles. We do yeah. see that a lot. We're based in Los Angeles too. Right. That's great. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you're African American for our people who are listening. And so as far as publishing, have you faced any particular challenges publishing as a black woman? Yeah. 
you know, I would say that uh, I'm sure, you know, I can only speak for my experience. So I want to say that. So I'm sure it's different for everybody. You know, there's people have different experiences depending on the year that they came into publishing, depending on what yeah. is going on. Uh, mm-hmm. There tend to be sort of cycles where we'll see more books by, you know, Black authors, Asian, and Latino authors. Now we're June, yeah. so we're in the middle of LGBTQ. <laughs> I don't want to say the wrong initials after that. But anyway, we're, <laughs> yes. we're in the middle of this month. And so there's more inclusion now than I think that there ever has been, which is a really good thing. Um, I cannot say that I have experienced any particular challenges. And the reason I say that is because, uh, and it's probably the time period that I came into writing. I know that other people, other authors have had very different experiences. I have heard them share them. Um, you know, I heard people say really offensive things or really uh, wanting them to change their characters' ethnicity or the way they speak or something to that effect. I haven't had that. I was, um, I, my books are published by the Wildwood Press. And I was at a conference and had a pitch session uh, and I had positive responses from all the publishing companies. Well, I should say all, but like there were so many, but the few publishing companies that I pitched with, I had positive responses. I have not gotten any negative pushback. Um, when you're traditionally published versus self-published, you don't pick your covers or anything like that. You just, right. I, I know one of my family members said, oh, your cover of Orange Blossom looks like you and your husband when you were younger. And I'm like, well, that's a coincidence if that's the case because I did not pick that cover. <laughs> and, um, mm-hmm. but, you know, we kind of give them an idea. Uh, so on the follow-up book, which is called Anything But Love, uh, there's Morgan, who's black and then there's a white man on the cover and a uh, actually a South African doctor on the cover too but I've been very happy with the covers I've uh I've oh, had good. a positive yeah people have asked me before I've had black writers who have said oh well did they want you to change this did they want you to change that I've actually not been asked to change one single thing so for me yeah. so that, that, not it, that, that sounds like you have a great relationship yeah, it's it's yeah. it's also very interesting because we were talking to a lady who writes fantasy, and when she first mm-hmm. entered that field, they said, "Oh, you can't be a woman and write fantasy." They wanted her to change her name or use her initials in her last name. So it's it's so interesting how the publishing industry has worked in the past and works now. And obviously, there's writers of all different ethnicities who are producing incredible books these days so it's good to hear that it has advanced from the past yeah Yeah, can you tell us also how did your work as a psychotherapist then help your work as a novelist well uh i think that it helped that's a good question and i think it helps me in terms of Characters who have, uh, there's a term in writing that's called deep point of view. And Mm. it is when you really try to, as the author, you really try to have your characters feel uh, very deeply so that the reader actually doesn't feel like they're reading a book, but they're really engaged with that character's struggles and what they're going through. It's kind of like when we watch a movie. We don't want to think that we're watching a movie. If it's really well done, we're just engrossed in the story. We're not thinking yeah. of characters, right? We're crying or laughing or in thought. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's really the same goal with writing that the reader is able to completely immerse themselves. So I think that because I'm, uh, because people are sharing with me their challenges, but it's really therapy is a lot of what the past was that led to the current challenge, right? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. I, and so it's not just I'm anxious about going outside 
you you explore what led up to that and then you find out well someone had a really bad experience one time when they were or someone left and they never came back they, they thought they thought their father was outside and then the father never returned and so you mm. so in my writing of my story the characters aren't these one-dimensional people so even when we look at so if we look mm -hmm. at um orange blossoms love Bloom, so David, the, the main male character, he was previously married. And the, his ex, soon to be ex-wife, he got divorced at the beginning of the novel. But she seems like a very superficial woman. She's really into a lot of status things, like the bling, the, the fancy car, the, the jewelry, the spa days, which nothing's like that, but you know, just like an excessive level of everything. But then as the novel progresses, we realize that David has ownership for the failure of his marriage too. See, it's not that because she was just this vain person who always needed so much, but he also, that, that he realizes that maybe he didn't believe him a lot. And so when he married her, he didn't, he really wasn't in love, but he didn't know that love existed, uh, that he didn't know what real love was. And so, and if I even go up by my own experience, I used to believe that, oh, do people just get married because they wanted to get married at a certain age and time, or do they really fall in love? I was kind of a dated person myself. And so, but in the <laughs> novels, so there's a dimension of, um, that reflects, it's a reflection of real life, right? It's a reflection of real life. And so we know mm -hmm. that women, I, I read a statistic recently, which was that women, purchase 80% of all books. And, uh, and of course, the romance genre is the largest genre. It's the, the highest selling genre. Let me clarify that. It is, it you know, that's about what I was, I was about to ask you about all that. So please elaborate more. And, and is it all of all fiction or just romance fiction that women are no, I that think, percentage? I think, no, of, of all books that are purchased, women are purchasing, or at least my understanding of that data, are purchasing 80% of all books. And for any kind of I, fiction? For any book. Any, fiction, oh, any book, period. Even nonfiction. Not, yeah, it could be a memoir. It could be cookbooks. And I think about the two newest oh. members um, of my family, some little great grand, whatever, generationally, uh, a niece and a nephew, I have bought them so many books. They are like three and two years old. And I have already bought that. And so, uh, so it's a good, <laughs> good for I'm you. I'm glad to hear that. Well, it's whomever. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And, but I think so. And so romance though, makes up the bulk of all sales. Romance does. It just wipes mm -hmm. the rest of the film. It just it's, it wipes it out. There's so many romance novels that are sold, and you know, so people have the different thoughts about romance. Romance novels cover a very wide range of genres, and so there are people who write dystopian romance novels. They're mm -hmm. paranormal. There are uh, success. There are more small town romance novels. There's sweet romance novels where there is no, there are no, um, there's nothing probably that's going to go on besides a kiss on the cheek. So that's sweet romance, right? It's a very low sweet level, as we say. And so there's, uh, and there's erotica, right? And then there's mystery, there's sweet mystery, like Mary Higgins Spark or whatever, cozy mystery. So there's a lot of different subgenres oh. in the town. Yeah. Uh, I never even realized that. And of course, oh, I know you know that because you're such an avid reader also and a writer. So would you talk about some of the popular tropes in romance and other forms of literature and entertainment? Sure. I would love to. No, no. <laughs> I was, I, I was recently... I was kind of breaking it down to my husband the other week because I think that romance is really known for its trope. And I told him, you know, we don't we don't say it and we don't describe it as such, but there are so many tropes in these male dominated films and books, 
rather it is taken one, taken two, taken three, with Liam Gleason. So the wife is taken in the first one, then it's the daughter, and he has to go capture them. You know, Mission Impossible, it's, there's a, like, La Femme Nikita, you know, uh, someone who hasn't been raised, uh, who's kind of been raised to be a, a hit person, a hit man or a hit woman. So those are, there's folks in absolutely all genres. So, I mean, I, I have mm-hmm. to say that. You know, if you're right for fiction, uh, there's a, a trope. He's the door stuff <laughs> coming in, the kids screaming, and uh, so, but they're coming after you. So, I would say all fiction has folks, and people are really readers are really depending on the authors to deliver the expectations of the trope. If the mm. soldier is coming mm. home from war, there is the expectation that that soldier will end up, in the end, being okay. We're not going to leave him with this post-traumatic stress disorder, struggling and having nightmares. He's going to get help before the end. I, yeah. uh, When my husband's watching his shows, I'm like, oh, you just love these shows with men in uniforms. They're either police officers, whether it's, uh, they said, the cowboy ones, or whether they're emergency firefighters, and they're going to rescue someone. Uh, so. Males actually love their tropes too, where they are the heroes uh, and they save the day. They may actually save mm-hmm. the baby. They may, you know, save the person from the burning building. So tropes are definitely storylines that, that serve a purpose. And so some of the tropes that are in romance, so I will mention them. Uh, but I also just want to say kind of like the caveat out there. Is, so people wonder sometimes about women and romance and why it's such a tool. And I'm like, oh, are we being kind of naive or unrealistic? Actually, women are so immersed in reality. Women deal with so much in reality. We are the primary caretakers of our children, of our parents, of our home, of making sure that it's nice, of you know, of just it doesn't matter if we're working outside the home or inside the home, or both we need our escapism too. We need true, our so true. Not because we're naive, but because we actually live a different world than men live in in many ways. We live with a different vulnerability just based on the fact that we're women. We're already raised to mm-hmm. be careful of mm-hmm. the strangers. I remember my mother used to always say, don't take gifts from men. He's going to expect from me. She was saying that. I didn't even know what she meant at the time. And so, but we live with, uh, you know, are we going to go out at night? We lock our car doors as soon as we get into it. We need our stories because our lives have some built-in risk factors that we just live with as a matter of fact. And if you have daughters, you just try to give them the lessons to be safe in the world. And you just hope that they are, but you try to give them tools. So reading serves as, we're consuming all these books for a reason. Uh, Mm -hmm. They are a a form of our uh, taking care of ourselves and our well-being to bring a smile to our faces. And so it's just kind of a different, sort of a little different twist on them. Um, And, but the tropes that are really, so some of the tropes are, uh, some people write, like I I met a woman at the LA Festival of the Month who was sitting at the booth with me, and she had been writing for many, many years, and she said each of her tropes involves a man in uniform and his dog, and I thought, well, that's interesting, which isn't exactly a trope, Mm -hmm. but it's, uh, um, you know, men in uniform are a trope, they are protectors, rescuers serving God, the country, the family, the community, the neighborhood. But so Mm -hmm. you have, um, I will tell you, the trope in um, Orange Blossom's Love Bloom is enemies to lovers. So uh, Elaine and David are enemies uh, initially. And so that's an enemies to lovers trope. Uh, in, In the third book that's coming out, yeah, not to re- it won't reveal too much, but it can well, kind of hint at it. But there's found family folks. It's somebody who finds that they have a family member they didn't know about. I'm sure with the current DNA testing that everybody's doing, there's probably a lot mm-hmm. of that going on. Yeah. There is friends to lovers, which is in this 
this is in the last book coming out too, is a friend to lovers. Uh, and so that could be someone who they've known each other for years or they reunite. There is a uh, story with forced proximity, which uh, is a component of a trope. So when mm-hmm. you look at um, Orange Blossoms and Love Bloom, there is forced proximity when Elaine's car breaks out on the road, David happens to come by. Okay. Anyway, he gives her a ride. They're going in the same direction. And when she ends up staying where he's staying, during, they end up being in forced proximity. So that's if a couple, you know, in a town and she gets snowed in at skiing and then she doesn't have a place to stay, her car broke down. That's like, it's forced proximity, right? There's, um, oh geez, there's, there's just lots of different tropes that are out there. Those are just some of them. This is so interesting. And, and, do each of these tropes have a format? Because I know some romance novels follow a format. You know, you, you're enemies in the beginning, and then you get to know each other, and then you're en- enemies again, and then finally they get together in the end. But do do you believe each of these tropes has a format? You know, I think that each trope, so people are looking for, so some people only read certain tropes. They, that's all they need. They just want that particular trope. Um, and my sister and my mother used to also read, in addition to um, some, well, some mysteries, but they also read, uh, and my mother used to read, she's no longer with us, but they would, and my sister still reads where they have, uh, there's some kind of murder and rescue and espionage. It might be a CIA agent. It might be uh, who has to come and rescue this woman or an operative who's forced to protect. I don't personally read those types of, I, I accidentally picked up a book that was like that. And I mean, I literally picked it up. It was at a hotel I was staying at. And they had to you can pick your book. And I thought, oh my God, this is like too dark for me. I don't know. But then I just kept reading it anyway. And it was more uh, potential. Yeah, there was, there was people dying in it. Even. So it's not the type of romance trope I would normally read. Um, yeah. but, but it was well written. Uh, so what I would say in terms of if there's, uh, I don't think there's an exact one yet. What I will say is this, that um, the requirement for a book to be considered a romance is, so it's kind of the yes and no. I'll, I'll modify that. So the requirement for a book, one of the requirements is that there is an HEA, which means a happily ever after. Okay. So mm-hmm. it is expected that whatever H-E-A. happens in between, there is a happily ever after. And, uh. and it may be, but it has to be, um, ideally, it's a hard one, happily ever after. If it is except not, for okay. except for Gone with the Wind, which was a great romance, and they did not live happily oh, right. ever after. <laughs> so that may not even qualify as a romance. I mean, it has a romantic element in it. And yeah, it wouldn't so, qualify. Yeah, so it could have a romantic element. Um, usually, so you don't. So you must have a, a happily ever after. You don't have to have a meet cute. By the way, you may have heard that term before too. Mm-hmm. And, um, so these aren't tropes, but they're elements that can go into a map. So a meet right. cute might be, for example, in Orange Blossoms, there was not a meet cute. It is, it's not required, but these are just elements that may be present. So Orange Blossoms doesn't mm-hmm. have a meet cute. It's actually quite serious in the beginning. It's an ex-boyfriend who is at the door. She's expecting someone else. He grabs her wrist, and um, the the main character who we haven't been introduced to yet, the main male character actually stops this other man from handling her roughly. And so that's definitely not a meet cute, right? It's a little definitely not. (laughs) However, in the second book that's out, Anything But Love, there is a meet cute. She's at the the main character's at the airport. Her friend hasn't shown up. She's about to go on this international trip that she's just looked forward to for years to South Africa. Her friend isn't showing up. She's not sure what to do. In any case, she ends up missing her flight and she has a giant margarita and <laughs> so she drinks too much and she kind of, when she goes to sit down, she sort of falls in the lap 
of this man. And so that's more of a meat seat. She falls asleep and she passes out kind of on this man. And, um, but anyway, so that's kind of a meat seat. That's the beginning, but it's a distinctive um, element that is like, oh, that's interesting. And there's, there also may be, so these are just some, some sort of things that occur, they're elements that are in there. Mm-hmm. So one may mm-hmm. also be a grand gesture. So Got a it. grand gesture, uh, which comes towards the end of the story, is mm. when the the person who, the, the romantic, uh, and I'm saying male, female, but of course it could be male, male, if a person writes male, male, you know, female stories and two female romance stories too. And just mm-hmm. using the structure that I use the format more. But yeah, a grand gesture is when someone proclaims love of the other person, but they do it in a really grand way. So in the third novel, mm. it'll be very, you know, it'll be a very big, it's a grand. big moment. It's a, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great. Something that would stand out. It can't just be saying, oh, don't you know I love you? It's more. Well, I have to ask, I have to change the subject slightly because I know you have a family and I, I'd love to know if balancing writing with your family is one of the more difficult parts of being a writer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was just yes. guessing. I was just guessing, but I said it right with you. Yes. I was just guessing. Yes, it is. It really is. Do- you know, I think that, were you going to say something? Oh, yeah. No. Uh, How many kids I- do you have? I only have one daughter. I'm very uh-huh. close to her. Uh, the word verbose comes to mind. She talks even more than I do. So I could <laughs> talk to her. Okay. Writing time. TikTok, TikTok. And so uh, my husband, I always have to tell myself, you should give him time. You should go and actually sit down with him and spend time with him instead of either reading a book or working on writing a book. I think about writing a book or plotting a book or doing the other aspects of it that I need to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I think it is a very, very big, uh, it's a tremendous challenge. It, it really is. And uh, I heard a writer recently on a, uh, on a podcast who was interviewed whose book is winning all these wonderful awards. And they asked him, so is it difficult um, finding the time to write? And he said, it's not difficult to find the time to write. It's difficult finding the time not to write, to actually talk to other people and to do things. The writing is the part that you do most mm. naturally, writing. And, but I would say that for my husband, and I, we have been married for decades now, even when I first met him, um, I probably, this is not really great, but I would come home and I would say, hi, how's it going? And I'd go completely in another room and shut the door and write. And I thought, <laughs> oh, I don't know how long it, and then it was being published, mind you, but I was still writing and, you know, submitting articles at that time and opinion pieces. And uh, at some point I thought, well, I guess I should go out there with him and talk to him and um um, oh, important. he worked that. Out. You guys got that worked out. What would you like our audience to have as their main takeaway today? I would say follow your passion. And I would, my uh, experience is if there is something that you are passionate about, you're truly passionate about, it never leaves you. It doesn't matter if it was a uh, a wish our home. Maybe you wanted to play drums when you were nine years old. You know, like someone wanted to play drums. That's not realistic. I can't make any money being a drummer. And if that's something you want to do, do it. Give yourself a, a you know a drum set. Who you know play the drums. If you want to dance, I met a woman recently, and she's in her seventies, and she dances three or four times a week, and she does all, and and she just is enjoying her life. And I would say whatever gives you pleasure. Just mm. go ahead and pursue it. Don't, it doesn't matter what other people think. Just, and yes, you'll have inhibitions. You'll feel like, what am I doing? Am I crazy? Or why am I putting forth this effort? It doesn't even matter. Just do it. Just 
put your inhibitions aside, have fun, live your life, do everything that brings your heart joy, because there's plenty out there that can bring our heart sorrow, right? There's oh. plenty. I love that. Thank mm-hmm. you. I love that message. And, and if you're passionate message. about it, you're good at it. So thank you so much, Dahlia. This has been just terrific. Our guest today on Late Boomers has been Dahlia Dupree, award-winning romance novelist and psychotherapist. You can find her books everywhere and also reach her on various social media sites and on her website, DahliaDupree.com. And we want to remind our listeners to follow us on Instagram at I am Kathy Worthington and at I am Mary Elkins and at Late Boomers and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Late Boomers Podcast. And please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Also, we try to bring you something interesting each week to uplift, inspire and entertain you. Thanks again, Dahlia. Thank you, Kathy and Mary. I really enjoyed it. Lovely. Thank you. We did too. Thank you for joining us on Late Boomers, the podcast that is your guide to creating a third act with style, power, and impact. Please visit our website and get in touch with us at lateboomers.biz. If you would like to listen to or download other episodes of Late Boomers, go to ewnpodcastnetwork.com. This podcast is also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and most other major podcast sites. We hope you make use of the wisdom you've gained here and that you enjoy a successful third act with your own style, power, and impact.